Ceiling Unlimited. Hello, Americans. This is Orson Welles. The men and women of Lockheed and Vega bring you this radio show with their good wishes for your Christmas. Tonight, we've taken our microphone to an important meeting of military chiefs somewhere in the United Nations. Robert speaking. Uh, yes, sir. No, sir. General Robert. Hold it, I'm talking to him now. What am I going to say to him? Uh, yes, sir. Just as soon as we know, sir. General Roberts, here are some new reports, sir. Hmm. Chung King. He has one from the Kremlin. Look at this one. Typical. A flyer who's had over 8,000 hours. Just as I was preparing to land, he says, a large purple one of the big belly type suddenly sucked the air right out from my plane. One of the purple variety. That's eh? what he says. One of the big bellied kind. Oh, they're beastly. Will someone tell me where those creatures come from? Their name derives from the old English transitive verb, grammy, meaning to vex, I believe. Grammy. To vex, huh? Well, if we don't get something definite, old Courtney will. Old Courtney, old Courtney will what? Yes. What is it old Courtney will do? Oh, well, I'm sorry, General Courtney. You mean about calling me old? Well, I am old. I've never felt older. 600 miles of the vilest weather I've ever flown in. And literally hundreds of them, gentlemen. Hundreds swarming all over the place. Won't you please take this chair, General? No, I will not. Well, three of the sharp-nosed ones aboard, gentlemen, and well... No less than 20 of the hairy, leggedy ones. Dad, you don't mean the ones with the triangular holes in their stomachs. What's their particular function? The holes for the wind to whistle through, of course. It makes the young pilots think they're going faster than they are. Villainous. There was one who blew a flute in me ear, like this. Beep, 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 beep. Yeah, he played it. He did it again. Huh? There. Hiding in your scarf, sir. Look, there it goes. Someone swat it. Swat it. Bash the little blighter. Oh, no, sir, don't hit it. It's a fifinella. Blast a fifinella! They're the females, sir. Sorry. <whistles> Bunged right through the window pane by thunder. Uh, plug that window, orderly. We are violating the blackout. General Roberts. Oh, has that wireless telephone come in again? Yes. It has. Oh, oh. Shortly before you arrived. What'd you tell him? There wasn't anything I could say. No, I suppose not. I think we can say it. The official report come in yet? I'll read it to you. Once upon a time, many, many long years ago, when this old earth ours was just beginning to stir in its sleep... Great day in the morning. Among the reeds and rushes, they lived the goblins and the gnomes and the elves and all the other little people of the fairy race. What? It's a report, Courtney. Go on. One little clan was different from all the rest. Different? Oh, my great aunt. Thousands and thousands and thousands of years, this little tribe lived in a lovely green wood. Oh, my grandmother's hat. Boil it down, somebody. Uh, well, Courtney, it seems that these little... Uh, uh, gremlins, whatever... uh, they were getting along uh, very well, minding their own business until we came along and dug up their woods to make an air for you. The general idea is that the gremlins are out to get even. Now, this young lieutenant... What young lieutenant? An American named Messler, one of my boys, has quite an idea. I ordered him to report here. Where is he? Lieutenant Messler reporting. General Roberts, sir. Messler, you're an authority on gremlins and the Fifinellas and the widgets. I've met them all, sir. Oh, Messler. Ever come on a spandoolie? Oh, yes, sir, once. Picked up six of them over Norway. They smeared ice on the wings, had little mops and pails. You ever run into a straight tail gremlin? Oh, they're hinged. They're blue in color. Blue. Bilious blue. With blue tinged fur. They snap rubber bands in the pilot's ears to make them pop. They carry a pocket full of soda straws, they do, and blow bubbles in the oil line. It's only a week ago, sir. It's only a week ago. Well, well... I was coming in for a night landing with only one flare at the end of the runway and a whole crowd of spade-nosed gremlins, you know, the kind that dig holes in the landing fields, I certainly rushed do. out, picked up the runway, and lifted it a good eight feet off the ground. Don't doubt it. And just as my wheels were going to touch the ground, they all caught sight of a young female. A vanilla. She was behaving just like Margie Hart. I know just what those gremlins did. You're right, sir. They dropped the runway and ran after her. There you are. Well, Lieutenant, you were brought here, I gather, because you have some sort of instructive suggestion. I'm coming to that, sir. However, I would first like to acknowledge my indebtedness to a young lady whose womanly intuition finally enabled me to win through. 
I'm referring to Miss Moira O'Dooligan. And uh, as long as this is a confidential report, I can state quite frankly that I was hoping shortly to make her my wife. Mm. <coughs> Congratulations. <laughs> It was while I was paying her a visit that I first received my new slant on the situation. Slant, eh? If you will permit me, sir, I will tell you about it. Hello, Ducky. Come into the house, my heart. Are you on leave? Only today. Give me a kiss, please. I've had a touch of nerves. Nerves? And you the calmest of men. Moira, they are getting me down. Is it the gremlin, you mean, dear? Hopping around the way they do in their suction boots. It, very unpleasant. Suction boots? Yeah, a new wrinkle of theirs. So the wind won't knock them down. Ah, the clever ones. Last night, they climbed into the gas tank and sucked up half the gas. A couple went swimming in the oil lines, and one of them got stuck. He's the worst. He's taken a personal dislike to me. Ah, no, my darling. The little ones are never personal. Well, this one is. Clarence. Clarence, his name is. Clarence Gremlin. Carries a hammer as big as himself. I power dive, and he clunks me on top of the head with it, or he runs out on my wrist and bangs me across the knuckles. Poor treasure. One after another. Bangs him like he was playing a xylophone. And he whispers, he whispers in my ears. When it's soupy and thick, he whispers at me. You're flying upside down, upside down, he whispers. Well, then just when I'm relaxing, he suddenly shouts, there's a jerry on your tail. I start to do a wing over and get away, and then he laughs. And that horrible, high-pitched, squeaky, little, awful giggle and reaches up, he does, and yanks a hair out of my head. Aww. That's his way of keeping tally. Look at me. I'm almost bald. Just like Muley, dear. Her tail, I mean. I beg your pardon? Muley is our cow at home in Ireland. Very interesting. And do you think there's some resemblance? It was Muley had the same identical trouble, me heart. They pulled all the hair out of her tail. They? The people of the she. Ah... Uh, your little one, my dear. Your Shiog. Is he fat or thin? Homely. Uh, thin, too. All the gremlins are thin. Legs like twigs. Ah, oh, the poor, wretched, hungry little creatures. It's starving, they starving? are. Starving? With all that good ethyl and oil and glycol they've been lapping up. Ah, oh, my heart, what they want is a bowl of cream. Cream? Faith, every child knows it. Pixies have ever been wild and mischievous. In the old times, they were after coming into the home itself and scaring the cat and sooting up the lamp chimney and tripping the cook. But sure, they only made trouble in houses where the folk were too mean entirely to be setting a bowl of cream out for them each evening by the back doorstep. Light him a life. Feed your gremlins their cream and they'll work for you. Do you mind me now? Cream? Yes. I read that years ago. So you did, my heart. Hmm. Get along without your cream now. And you may save the hairs on your head and the wear and tear in your nerves. And now you can be given me a kiss if you will. And that, sirs, is how I got on to it. Cream. Cream. Cream? Sirs, cream is the answer. Well, uh, the if answer. I may continue. Well. well, I left Miss O'Dooligan's residence, and that very night I remembered to fly with a half-pint bottle of the very best heavy cream in my pocket. The visibility was excellent. I was up about 25,000 feet when Clarence appeared. He was outside this time on one of the wingtips. He had his little hammer. I could see him darting back and forth in the moonlight, hammering and testing here and there. I tried to catch his eye. I waved to him. He just went on hammering. And to make matters worse, who should show up behind me but three Messerschmitts and a Folkwolf 190? The Folkwolf let go. The hammering continued. It was Clarence inside now, tapping away busily at the dials. I made a grab for him. But he got away behind the transmitter. I didn't have anything to throw at him but that bottle of cream. I threw it, all right. Smashed just over his head and broke. All a mess of cream flew out all over him, dousing him from head to foot. Says he was the wettest, maddest gremlin you ever saw. The Jerry's were still after me, and I was so busy for the next ten minutes, I didn't have time to think of Clarence at all. Suddenly... 
I got the queerest feeling in the pit of my stomach, says. The hammering was different. It went something like this. I saw him now close by me in the light of the moon. He looked dreamy and smacked his lips. Like the cream, Clarence? There's more where that came from, but you've got to behave. Okay, if you really want to help, take a look at these Messerschmitts behind us. Know anything about German engines? If you do, then sick them. <laughs> And that, sirs, is my report. Interesting. Frankly, it's, it's the explanation of how I managed to account for three enemy aircraft. Cream. 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 Yes, sir? Cream, sirs. But it's very hard to come by. Hard to come by. Gentlemen, we'll skim. Every oh, pail in the United Nations, if necessary. Gentlemen, the gremlins will get their cream. Yes, sir. Uh-oh. Headquarters? Oh, yes, sir. It's him. Uh, he. Uh, uh, you take it, Courtney. Don't want to. Well, if you say so, Robert. Seniority, I suppose. Hello? Uh, yes, sir. I'm sorry, sir, but I was inadvertently detained. Yes, sir. Oh, sir, flying conditions are excellent over the entire period, sir, over the entire area, yes, sir. You no need to fear our anti-aircraft, and, uh, sir, I think we've got the gremlin problem licked. You do it with cream, and then they won't bother you. In fact, they'll help you. Cream, yes. Just put it anywhere they can get at it. I should say smear some on the reindeers, on the tips of the horns and the hooves. The antlers, particularly, and on the runners of the sleigh. Thank you, sir. Good night and Merry Christmas. Ladies and gentlemen, only once every couple of centuries a new legend appears on the face of the earth. That there are gremlins in this war is a tribute to the imperishable lightheartedness of the heroes whom they are harrying. It's our happy Christmas thought for this year. That as long as pilots of the Allied nations are capable of gremlins, nothing, gremlins included, can ever get them down. In our cast tonight, an old Mercury friend, an old Mercury star, Joseph Cotton, enacted the role of Lieutenant Messler. Agnes Moorhead's part in the festivities consisted of some Irish brogue. Lou Merrill was General Roberts, and General Courtney was your obedient servant. Anthony Collins wrote the music, Lud Gluskin conducted it. And all of us wish all of you all the good things there are to wish for this Christmas. Good night, Americans. This program has come to you from the Lockheed and Vega Aircraft Corporations of Burbank, California. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.